Okay, so uh, it's recording. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, lecture 10 of the course Quantum Theory in a Nutshell. Um, so let me clarify that, uh, uh, that for the quiz, uh, um, you don't have any calculations that you need any, any type of machine but your brain, okay? So you don't, you don't have to worry about that. Um, um, okay, so let me start with, the, with a very short recap of what we talked yesterday. So yesterday we started to uh, provide uh, uh, a mathematical description of quantum mechanics. And um, what we did was to um, essentially uh, start uh, writing some postulates that will uh, tell, uh, th th those po postulates will tell us how to extract physics from um, quantum systems. And um, the last part of the lecture was devoted to the discussion of the measurement outcome. As we discussed yesterday in quantum mechanics, um, the general situation is not of uh, computing what will be the outcome of the experiment, but what will be the probability that a given outcome will be seen in, in a measurement. So this is very important. So this is a very different concept that, uh, and a very different uh, way of, 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 of describing system if you consider classical mechanics. And um, uh, the key point uh, for the extraction of this probability is, uh, is given by this postulate too. Um, that if you, so in the context of photon polarization, so if you prepare a, a photon in a state of polarization A, then the probability that will be observed with polarization B after passing through a polarizer is given by the absolute value squared of this Dirac bracket P A, okay? And uh, we also- Hello. Oh, hi, Manu. Please, we can't see your screen. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a very important point, <laughs> but uh, thanks uh, for pointing out. But let me share the screen. Uh, so it's Friday, we are all tired, so please uh, forgive me. <laughs> Do you see my screen now? Okay, very good. Okay, so I was mentioning that this postulate too uh, tells us that um, uh, if a photon is prepared in a polarization state A, then the probability that will be observed with polarization B after crossing a polarizer um, is given by this uh, absolute value squared of the Dirac bracket B A. And being a probability, this number should be between zero and one, including zero and one. Um, and we, we learned that if uh, a photon is prepared in a polarization state A, then the probability of finding a fo the photon with polarization um, A after crossing a polarizer of polarization A will be the um, absolute value square of the Dirac bracket A, A, and this should be one. And that's why you have to normalize the state vector. And uh, since this number uh, P of B, A should be between zero and one, uh, we have to check if this is satisfied or not. And again, the normalization is, is important because if you compute the absolute value squared of BA, then you can use the Schwarz inequality and this is less or equal than the absolute value squared of the, uh, of the Dirac uh, 
bracket B, B, and A, A. And since by assumption or since by postulate one, B, B, and A, A have uh, norm one, then this is less or equal than one. So you ensure that this probability um, um, of finding a photon in a state B, if it was prepared in a state A after crossing a polarizer, is less or equal than one. And this is uh, absolutely consistent with the, with the uh, probabilistic description, right? I mean, um, you cannot get a negative uh, probability, you cannot get a probability that is higher than one, and, and so on, okay? Very good, so this was uh, uh, the point that we closed the yesterday's session. And um, now I want to make a comment that, um, so, so far we have been discussing um, linear polarization. And uh, in, in linear polarization, if you think about uh, electromagnetic waves, this means that your uh, electromagnetic wave has some electric field that oscillates uh, um, um, a long time. And if it crosses a polarizer, a linear polarizer, then uh, after crossing the polarizer, the electromagnetic wave will have an oscillatory electric field that oscillates in a fixed direction, okay? That, that is the, the, the role of the polarizer, is precisely to select a specific direction uh, such that the electric field will be confined to this direction and it will be oscillating in this direction. But there is another, um, another uh, uh, type of polarizer, which after uh, 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 an electromagnetic wave crosses this, uh, this polarizer, the electric field will oscillate, okay? So it will, its magnitude will, you know, get to a mass maximum and then we reduce to, it will cross zero and then goes to the other uh, uh, orientation. But also the, the, the arrow that describes the, the oscillating arrow that describes the electric field will rotate, okay? And this is what we call a circular polarization. And this is a, a fact about optics that when light, so if you prepare a light, uh, uh, in a circular uh, polarization, uh, uh, then the, if you cross this light, which is circ circularly polarized, uh, if you cross it on a linear polarizer with some right direction phi, then the intensity of the outgoing wave will be half of the intensity of the ingoing wave. So this is, this always happens irrespective of the angle phi, okay? So if you send a, a circularly polarized uh, a wave against a linear polarized polarizer with some direction phi, then you always verify that after the polarizer, the intensity of the wave will be reduced by a factor of two. So you you divide the intensity by two. So this means from a photon perspective that if a photon is circularly polarized, then the probability of getting this photon uh, in a linear uh, polarized state after crossing a polarizer with angle phi, the probability will be one over two. So you have uh, um, half of your chances of getting the photon uh, uh, crossing the linear polarizer, half of chances of the photon uh, not crossing the polarizer. So it's a 50-50% uh, gain, 
So either the photon will cross or it will not cross and the, the, the odds are the same, okay? So this is, I'm just a state, so this, this thing in blue is just a fact about uh, optics. And I'm just uh, telling you this fact. You don't have to understand, at this moment, you don't have to understand why this is so. I mean, for that you should go back to uh, optics and, 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 and study electromagnetic waves. Um, but, Irrespective of that, I want to describe this in the language of photons. And as we have seen, uh, okay, so there is the question how uh, the circular polarization works. So in a very, uh, 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 let's say, simplistic uh, explanation, because I will not have time to go uh, deep on, on that, uh, the linear polarization selects a specific direction that the electric field will uh, oscillate. But in the circular polarization, the electric field will oscillate, so along a direction, but this direction will also rotate with time, okay? So this is why we call circular polarization, okay? Um, so I want to describe what is the state uh, uh, of a photon in a circular polarization, okay? And, well, I mean, we are describing uh, uh, the photon polarization state, the quantum state, as a column vector with two entries. So I'm going to say that a, a photon with circular polarization C will be in a state with entries C1 and C2. And this is, I'm just starting with, uh, with a postulate one, I mean, the state vector will be, uh, uh, in this case, in this particular case that we are studying system, a two-level system, will be a column vector with two entries, okay? And by this fact that I just uh, mentioned, uh, the probability of getting uh, the, the photon in a state of linear polarization phi if it is prepared uh, in a circular uh, polarization state C is given by one over two. So this is just a fact that follows from this statement. But according to postulate two, um, this probability can be computed by uh, the absolute value squared uh, of the Dirac bracket phi c. Let me just say that uh, uh, in the in postulate two, you could think that I was speaking just about linear polarization, and there is nothing wrong with that thinking, but I'm just saying that this is more general than that. And uh, the probability then is equal to one over two, and by postulate two, this quantity is computed by this, um, um, this mathematical uh, operation here. But we know what is the state of a photon if it is linearly polarized in direction phi. It is just as we have learned uh, in the previous lectures. This is nothing but... Um, so the state phi will be cosine phi sine phi. Okay. So if I want to compute this quantity, I have to take the bra associated with this cat. And remember, in order to obtain the bra from a cat, you have to transpose the vector and take the complex conjugate of the entries. But cosine and sine are real functions. So I just transpose this, this, this vector. This will be the bra associated with phi, so this number. And here I have to multiply by the cat C. And the cat C is just C1 and C2 in a column vector. So I have to compute this product between these a row vector with this column vector 
and this will give me a scalar okay so when i compute that i will have cosine phi times c1 so i write it here sine phi times c2 i write it here and i sum them of course and remember i have to compute the absolute value and square it okay so um then i just have to compute uh, uh, the absolute value of this number that is inside here and the square but remember c1 and c2 can be complex numbers so the absolute value should be this number times its complex conjugate okay this will be the absolute value squared uh, in expansion of uh, so there is a question in the chat expansion of postulate 2 page 14 is uh sorry uh okay hello sir i'm asking about uh, uh in page 14 expansion of the first lead we had um c1 squared cos squared psi plus c2 squared sine psi is that yeah, sine right. not right. squared yeah. it, it should you. be squared thanks but i I'm, I'm getting there but you're right uh it should be sine squared thanks um okay so um i have to take this complex number take it it's complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate will be C1 star cosine phi, because cosine phi is a real number, plus C2 star sine phi times the complex number itself. So I just repeat what is written here, here. And I have to multiply this number with this number. And then comes the, 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 the comment uh, by John. Uh, so C1 star cosine phi, times c1 cosine phi will give c1 star times c1 which is the absolute value squared of c1 so it enters here and uh, cosine phi times cosine phi so cosine phi squared um, then i can take the product of this term with this term so this will be C2 star times C2. This is the absolute value of C2 squared. And so I think there is a problem in the connection. Um, did you have a problem with your connection? Okay. So now you are you are coming back. Okay. Good. I will wait just to, uh, that people can rejoin. So we are still 26, so people are still joining. Okay, so I think we are we are getting there. So I will continue with the explanation. Um, so I was uh, I don't know uh, until when uh, you were listening to what I said, but I was taking the product of this complex conjugate number with the number itself. So I was saying that uh, if I look at the product of the first term with the first term, then I get this one. Mm. Ah, so Grace is asking why are we using C1 and C2? 
and not cosine and sine for the state C? Because uh, this is a good question. Uh, because this uh, uh, state here corresponds to linearly polarized photons, while this state corresponds to circularly polarized uh, photons. And we want to discover what is the form of C1 and C2 if, if the photon is uh, circularly polarized. So we don't know what to put here. And we are going to discover that. Uh, let me check the chat. Uh, I Mahmoud said, I think after circular polarization, you get unpolarized light. Um, I don't I don't get this comment. So if you're if you're performing a circular polarization of light, you are going to get circularly polarized light. No. Hello, Anton. Hi. Yes. Uh, before the linear uh, polarizer, we have the the electric field is oscillate as different directions in different direction. The linear polarization just select one of these directions. Okay. Now the circular one, it will repeat. You say the direction of this oscillation will be rotate. Yes. That means we have different directions again. Yes. of the, this electric field. Yes. How this it will be uh, polarized? Well, uh, you know, it's not it's not true that um, um, for a general electromagnetic wave that the electric field is oscillating and rotating, right? Because you see that it, it rotates, but it keeps uh, uh, the magnitude fixed. So, for instance, you can also have a different situation where the electric field is rotating, but also changing the magnitude. So it becomes some, something like an ellipse instead of a, a circular polarization. So this is a very uh, specific uh, uh, um, uh, configuration for the electric field as well. So this is why you call circular polarization, because the electric field is oscillating, but in a perfect cir uh, circle uh, um, uh, along, uh, you know, uh, the flow of time. So it's not uh, it's not obvious that uh, the, in a general electromagnetic wave, the electric field will behave like that. Okay. Um, good. So if you keep with the algebra here. Uh, you multiply the second term with the second term, then you get this contribution as John correctly fixed, it, it should be squared, uh, and also here. And, um, and then you have the cross terms. So you have this term times this term. So this will give C1 star, C2, cosine phi, sine phi, and this term times this term, and it will give this contribution here. So you see that for these two last terms, I have the same sine phi cosine phi multiplying the numbers. So I can factor out these numbers. Okay, so sine phi cosine phi multiply this quantity. And for the first term, I have uh, C1 squared cosine phi squared plus C2 squared sine phi squared. Okay, but remember, this probability must be 1 over 2 for any angle phi. Okay, that's the statement in blue. In particular, I can take phi equals to 0. Okay, since this must hold for every uh, uh, phi, I can choose phi equals to 0. So if I choose phi equals to 0, then cosine will be 1, sine will be 0, and this term here, because sine is zero, drops, okay? So if I choose the angle as being zero, then I, I'm just uh, uh, left with an absolute value of C1 squared. And this must be equal to one over two. So I get this conclusion here, okay? But again, 
this entire structure must be true for any value of phi. So I can also now choose a different value of phi, and this relation here should be also consistent. So if I choose phi equals to pi over 2, then cosine of pi over 2 will be 0, so this term drops. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, so this will be uh, 1 times absolute value of C2 squared. Plus, and then this drops because cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So again, I'm left just with one term that is absolute value of C2 is squared. And this must be equal to 1 over 2. And from that, I conclude that the absolute value of C2 squared must be 1 over 2. So just by analyzing this uh, equality here, so this equality, this equals to 1 over 2 and choosing different values of phi, I'm concluding that the uh, C1 and C2, the entries of my state vector C, should be such that the absolute value squared of, the, of, of C1 and C2 must be equal to 1 over 2, okay? So C1 and C2 are complex numbers such that the norm squared is 1 over 2. And as we have learned yesterday, I can parameterize a complex number that has some uh, norm as the norm of this complex number times a phase, okay? So C1 will be, okay, so there is a question, uh, where are we getting one over two from? You're getting from this statement uh, that comes from optics, okay? I'm saying that the probability of getting uh, photons in a linear polarized state after, uh, if it, they were prepared uh, in a circular polarized state is always 1 over 2. Okay, this is a fact. Um, and I'm just exploring that in the language of photons. Okay? Very good. So C1 must be a complex number that has norm squared 1 over 2. So I write it as its norm, okay? So the norm is 1 over square root of 2 times a phase, namely an exponential of i to some angle for, uh, alpha. Uh, C2 must also be a complex number of norm uh, squared 1 over 2. So I write it as its norm namely I take the square root of that and uh, multiply by a phase and the phase will be e to the i beta, okay? So this, uh, this structure of C1 and C2 that I found here comes from the very fact that uh, I am imposing that the probability of getting a linear polarized photon in direction phi if it was prepared in a circular polarized state is always 1 over 2. But um, now I can look again at this relation here and choose a different value for phi. In particular, I can choose phi equals to pi over 4. Okay? So pi over 4 is the angle for which uh, cosine and sine are both uh, um, 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 square root of 2 divided by 2. So if I plug phi equals to pi over 4 in this equation, cosine squared of pi over 4 will be 1 over 2. Sine squared of pi over 4 will be 1 over 2. So I get these two contributions here. And sine phi uh, times cosine phi so here there is a factor that is missing. There should be a factor 1 over 2 here as well. Okay? It's 1 over 2 times this number. Okay? Now, uh, um, look at this. So this is 1 over 2. I can factor 1 over 2 here. This will be absolute value of C1 squared plus absolute value of C2 squared. This is 1 right? Because 
if you sum this with this, this gives one. So this will give one over two. And this uh, term here, I can write um, as exponential uh, to the i when c1 star will be one over two exponential of minus i uh, alpha because I'm taking the star and c2 will be one over square root of two um, um, exponential of um, i beta, okay? Um, so I can, I can just write, uh, um, so maybe this is one over four actually. Uh, but yeah, so don't trust these factors. You have to work out by yourselves, but uh, this will not change the final conclusion. So I have this factor one over two, summing this factor one over four times the sum of exponentials. And this comes from this equation, which says that this quantity should be one over two, okay? So I just uh, equate this with one over two, and you see that this one over two cancels with this one over two, and you are left with this number here equals to zero, okay? But as we saw, the sum of exponential of minus an angle with the exponential of i times the same angle uh, uh, is proportional to the cosine of this angle. So if I sum these two, this will be cosine uh, alpha minus beta equals to zero, okay? So when I use this equation here, so one over two equals to this thing, replace C1 and C2 by these parametrizations here, I get, and, and choose phi equals, equals to pi over four, I get a constraint on the value of alpha and beta because they must be uh, such that the cosine of the difference between alpha and beta is zero, okay? So uh, now we have a constraint uh, uh, on, on alpha and beta, and I have to solve this trigonometric equation. So for which angles cosine is zero? Well, if alpha min uh, minus beta is pi over two, then this equation is, is, is obeyed. If alpha minus beta is minus pi over two, this equation is also uh, satisfied. But of course, uh, trigonometric functions are um, periodic functions. So I can always add to a given angle, a factor of two pi times an integer. And this will also uh, satisfy the equation. So the general solution for this equation is something of this type. Um, uh, alpha minus beta uh, should be plus or minus pi over two up to a factor of two pi times a, an integer n, okay? So this is the general relation that I have up to a factor of two pi n. But this factor of two pi n, I can cancel by using the freedom that I can define states um, up to a global phase. We saw that yesterday. So if I just choose now beta as being alpha plus pi over two. So if I choose beta as being plus, uh, sorry, beta being alpha, plus pi over two, I will have, uh, for this C2, I will have alpha plus pi over two. So I'll have C2 will be something of the type, uh, one over square root of two, E, and this will be alpha plus pi over two. And the other solution will be one, square root of two i to alpha minus pi over two. Uh, okay. 
okay so there are some so there is a comment that sine of pi over four times cosine of pi over four uh, is uh, one over two and that's correct um, then John say says that he's lost okay uh, okay uh, let me just just finish with the with the discussion and then I'll just make a recap of what I did okay um, then there is is there a reason for using radians no I mean uh, uh, it's just because uh, it is uh, uh, more useful, for instance, if you want to expand a function in a Taylor series and so on. But in principle, you can just work out with degrees, okay? Um, good, so I have these two possibilities for C2, and you see that if you compute what is the value of exponential of i pi over two, remember exponential of i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So exponential of i pi over 2 will be cosine pi over 2, which is 0, plus i sine of pi over 2, which is 1. So this is nothing but i. Okay? So C2 will be i square root of 2 exponential of i alpha and you can work out the same here and this will since this has uh, the minus sign here this will be minus i okay so what we are seeing is that for these angles uh, for, for the solution of this equation c2 is exponential of i alpha times i or minus i Okay, both solutions are correct. And therefore, we can define two states, namely the state, the state C that satisfies this equation can be either this one where I factor out the exponential of I alpha because I have the freedom of removing such a factor um and uh um i i chose the plus sign so i call this state the cat plus and uh i can choose the minus sign and i'll get another state which is given by these entries one and minus i okay and you see that uh you can see that these states they will correspond to they will correspond to circular polarization, and uh, that's they are independent in the sense that they are orthogonal. So if you compute the scalar product between plus and minus, this will give zero. So what I'm saying is that the state, the possible states C that solve this equation here, are those states. So a photon which is circularly polarized can be in this state or in this state. And uh, the interpretation is that this plus corresponds to a polarization that is what we call, a, 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 well, you can have circular polarizations directed to the right or circular polarization direct to the left and this will correspond to left polarization and right polarization okay okay so we did a lot of algebra here so let me just um, make a general recap of what we did so that you don't get lost in the algebra that is pretty simple so you can really just go through this and do it yourself and i really recommend that but let me just um, um, explain to you what is the picture, okay? And the picture is the following. So I just started with the fact that circularly polarized electromagnetic waves always uh, uh, have the intensity after crossing a linear polarizer uh, divided by two. So the intensity of the outgoing 
wave after the linear polarizer will be divided by two with respect to the with with respect to the intensity of the initial uh, wave. Okay, so this is a fact from optics in the description of uh, radiation as a wave. And now I wanted to give a description in terms of photons. So what I did was to declare that a photon that is circularly polarized has a state of this form. C, the cat C, with entry C1 and C2, corresponds to a photon which is circularly polarized. Okay? And then I just used postulate 2 to say that the probability of getting a photon in a state phi if it was prepared in a state C is given by the absolute value squared of this scalar product, okay? And then I just uh, reminded you that a photon in a linear uh, polarization state is described by this cat if the polarizer has direction phi. So what I did here was just to replace the bra phi by this row vector formed by cosine phi and sine phi and replace the cat C by this uh, uh, state that I defined here to represent a photon which is circularly polarized. Okay? Then, by this fact, this quantity here must be equal to 1 over 2. So the probability must be 1 over 2. So this is a calculation that essentially means that you have to take the product of a row vector with a column vector, and I just work it out this explicitly. Uh, so the, it, it gives this number. And then you have to take the absolute value and the square. Okay, but in order to do so, um, you have to remind you uh, remind yourself that the absolute value of um, of a complex number, the absolute value squared of a complex number, is the number times uh, its complex conjugate. So I just wrote here the complex conjugate, and I work it out the explicit multiplication, and gives this expression here. So I invite you to, to do this calculation by yourself. Um, and then I, I said this relation, namely this thing here being equal to 1 over 2, must hold for any chosen uh, angle phi. With that, I can choose different values of phi, and this relation must still be true. Um, so I started choosing specific values of phi in order to try to get information about C1 and C2, okay? So by choosing phi equals to zero and phi equals to pi over two, I have discovered that the absolute value of, the absolute value squared of C1 and C2, uh, they must be equal to one over two. And, well, this is a complex number with norm squared 1 over 2. So I just wrote uh, this in, a, in the parametrization using a phase. So this is a phase times the norm of the complex number, a phase times the norm of the complex number. Since these numbers, in principle, they are different, I chose, I chose an angle alpha and an angle beta. Okay? And now I just work it out, this equation here, namely this equals to one over two for a different choice of phi, which is pi over four, okay? And then if I plug here phi equals to pi over four, I get this equation. So this must be equal to one over two. But since C1 and C2 must have this form, I just replaced here the exponentials, and just by simplifying what I could, I get this equation here. 
So I, I started from complex exponentials and wrote in terms of trigonometric function. And now I have to solve this equation because this equation is telling you that alpha and beta are not independent. They must be such that the difference gives the cosine of this angle equals to zero. So I solved this equation and this corresponds to beta equals to alpha plus or minus pi over two. And then you just go back to these relations here, replace beta by alpha plus or minus pi over two. And just by doing that, you get two different possible solutions, either this one or this one, where I just canceled out the phase exponential of I alpha because I have this freedom as we discussed yesterday. So those solutions correspond to the states C that are circularly polarized photons that will satisfy this equation here for any value of phi. So if I use this state phi, which is cosine phi and sine phi, and use the vectors plus or minus, this will always hold, okay? So I have discovered what are the states associated with circular polarization of the photon. And as we just saw, there are two different states that corresponds to circular polarization. One which corresponds to a rotation to the left and one that corresponds to a rotation to the right, okay? And I said that you can show that these vectors are orthogonal. So if you take the scalar product between these vectors, this will give zero, okay? After the summary, is the picture clearer now? Okay. Uh, John, are you still lost? There is there a specific point you want uh, more explanation? Okay, good. Okay, so this is, uh, this type of calculation that I did is, is, uh, is a, a calculation that you should reproduce because you will do that very often, okay? Good, so now I want to talk about uh, uh, observables uh, because this is, uh, what uh, matters for us when we go to the lab, make a measurement. So observables are, by definition, those quantities that you can measure, okay? So, um, and as we are discussing here, uh, the way that observables are defined in quantum mechanics is very different from uh, uh, what we were used to in classical physics. So in quantum mechanics, I'm telling you the probability of finding uh, uh, a photon with a given property. So what is the property that I'm measuring? Is the polarization of the photon. So I'm not, uh, 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 what, what I'm telling you is that if you ask me, so, can you tell me if the photon um, um, that was circularly polarized now is linearly polarized? Well, I can tell you the following. So there is 50% uh, of chances that this photon will be linearly polarized, okay? So if you go to a lab and prepare the system and make a measurement, half of the times that you make the measurement will you see photons linearly polarized and half of the times you are not going to see, okay? So the outcomes are different even though the system was prepared in an identical fashion, okay? So 
quantum mechanics gives you a prescription to extract probabilities of, of getting some properties uh, of, of uh, physical quantities. So, um, but of course, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking about a very particular system, which is the uh, a very particular physical property, which is the polarization of photons. But, I mean, I could just, just ask, I mean, what is the position of, of, of a particle uh, at a given time t? And, of course, I mean, polarization is something that you say yes or no. Is, is it linearly polarized? Uh, yes or no. I mean, it's, 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 it's something that has this binary choice. But if I ask what is the position of a particle at time t, well, there are infinitely many points in space where the particle can be. So it's a much more uh, difficult uh, uh, question. And we have to find a way of making this type of, of, of statements regarding the chances of measuring a physical property uh, more systematic. So we want to make this, uh, uh, we want to, to find a way of treating quantum mechanics and the predictions of probabilities uh, of the outcomes more systematic. So in order to start this discussion, let me assume that I want to measure a quantity A, so it can be the energy, it can be the position, it can be the angular momentum of, of, of a system. So it's a, a physical quantity A. But for simplicity, instead of, you know, as I said, the position of a particle can have a continuum uh, set of values. So it can be x1 or x1 plus a tiny epsilon and so on. So it's a continuum uh, set of, of, of possibilities. So instead of starting with such a difficult uh, problem, I will assume that the physical quantity that I'm looking at can take um, a finite uh, set of values. So if I measure this quantity, I know that it must have a finite set of possibilities that I can measure. And the values that I can get are labeled by numbers A1, A2, up to An. So I can have N possibilities of, of outcomes. And also, I'm going to make an assumption now, which is the following. Um, given a system, I will assume that there is one and only one state defined by the cat E, J, such that if the system is in this state, then the value that I will measure for A is A, J. Okay? And I'm assuming that this state is unique. Not unique in the sense that I cannot multiply by, by global faces, but unique in the sense that um, I don't have a state which is, for instance, orthogonal to this state, but also gives the value aj, okay? That's what I mean. So, uh, if uh, I want to measure the quantity a, and I measure that, and I obtain the value ak, then I know that the system was in a state E j with j equals to k. Okay, this is uh, this is uh, a very central hypothesis here. But now I can uh, just use the postulate to, and as I said, I I wrote the postulate in terms of photon polarization. But now I'm talking about a general uh, physical quantity, and I can just um, um, by using postulate two, say the following. So the probability of uh, measuring um, um, the system in that was prepared in state 
EJ um, um, to be in the state EK is equal to this symbol delta KJ. Let, let, uh, do not freak out. So I'm saying that the probability of finding the value a k namely that the system is in the state e k if the well i wrote here the photon prepare but it could be a general system uh, if the system is in the state e j is given by this expression and this symbol delta k j is just a compact way of saying the following Delta kj is 1 if k is equal to j. And delta kj is 0 if this is not the case. So if k is equal to j, then this is 1. If k is different to j, then this is 0. So what I'm saying is that the probability of getting the value a k if the system is prepared in the state E J is one, one hundred percent. If this is this J is actually K, but it's zero if J is different from K. Okay, so this is what this uh, equation is telling to me. Um, but again, by using the freedom that I have to choose global phases, I can write. This, uh, this expression, essentially I, I can take the square root of this expression and extract that E K scalar product with E J is delta K J. This delta, if you don't know it, it's called the chronicle delta. And what I'm saying that those states, E K and E J, they are either uh, uh, I mean, if k is equal to j, this is 1. So if k is equal to j, then the state is the same. So you have e, k, e, k, and this is 1. Or, for instance, if you have e, 1, and e, 2, these states are different, and this is 0. Just I'm just following the rules here. So if the state that you put here is the same as the state that you put here, then you get one. If the state that you put here is different from the state that you put here, it's zero. So what I'm saying is that the states that are different, they are orthogonal. And if the states, if the states that you put here are the same, then they have norm one. This is what I'm saying in simple words. Okay. Okay, so um, I think I have to stop for a break. But just to just to close the sentence, um, you see that those uh, um, states E J, they will. So if you take E one, E two, up to E n, they will form a, a orthonormal set of n vectors, right? Because these vectors, they are different. And if you multiply, if you take the scalar product of this vector with any other of this set, this will give zero, so they are orthogonal. But if you take the scalar product of this vector with itself, it is one, so it is normalized. So this is a set of vectors that are orthonormal okay do you do you understand what i mean by that okay so um then uh, uh we are going to use this this uh this fact that these are orthonormal vectors to construct a basis as you see in linear algebra if you if you have a basis uh, uh, to describe a vector space then you can always find a base uh, where the vectors 
that form the basis are orthonormal, okay? And we're going to use that, this, this set of vectors as a basis for our vector space, okay? So now we stop and we go for the break. And in 10 minutes, we come back for the, for, to keep the discussion a little bit more, okay? Okay, so enjoy your break. Uh, bye.